on mute uh, throughout the entire webinar. And at the end of the event, uh, if you could hold all questions to the end, uh, both speakers will take all of your questions then. Um, to ask a question, to the left of your name is a question mark. Please type in your question there, and we'll make sure that we get the question answered at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce to you our Executive Director of ACT, uh, David Strauss. Thanks, Casey. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our, our webinar this month. Uh, we had over, as Casey mentioned, over 200 registrants for today's webinar. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this topic, uh, representing a wide range, a wide range of sectors within the transportation demand management industry. Um, please take a moment right now to let us know how many people are watching uh, with you. We'll put a poll up. All righty, it should be live right now, and you can just take a moment to let us know. All right, they're coming in. A lot of zeros. Ah, so that means there's one person. Yeah, there's just one. <laughs> All righty. Um, the Association for Commuter Transportation is an international association leading advocate for commuter transportation and transportation demand management programs. We strive to get the most out of our transportation system while improving the lives of commuters, increasing the livability of communities, and supporting the economic growth of businesses as we look to create a better journey for everyone. Please take a moment to let us know if you're a member. All right. So it looks like we've got almost uh, 50, 40, 40% um, that are non-members. So that's that's great to see a lot of folks joining in today. And um, if you already are a member, you know the valuable benefits that you receive, the services from ACT, including networking, learning, advocacy, public policy, and research. If you're not a member, I invite you to learn more about us and, in, and encourage you to join us. Uh, and possibly attend one of our upcoming events. We have our international conference in uh, New Orleans at the end of July. Um, curious to know if anyone's planning to attend. Absolutely. Love it. Keep it going. All righty. Uh, there's a lot of great information up on the website, actcomp.org. Uh, you can learn more, view the whole program, see the keynotes. We also have our TDM forum in October in Las Vegas featuring two days of discussions on the future of TDM. But today's webinar, is Smart, City, Smart Mobility, Smart Cities, and the Columbus Smart Cities Challenge, will present the latest from Columbus, Ohio, winner of the 2016 DOT $40 million Smart City Challenge. Columbus's winning vision laid out initiatives that embodied several TDM goals, including improving access to jobs through expanding mobility options, connecting residents to safe, reliable transportation for all, and developing a more environmentally sustainable transportation system. It's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Marin Weimer. Marin is the Senior Associate Director at the Ohio State University Center for Automotive Research, or CAR. Marin is the senior, um, and she is responsible for planning, directing, and developing the center's programs while managing and providing oversight of all administrative, operational, fiscal, and human resources responsibilities. Marin previously worked at General Mills for 13 years as a continuous improvement standards leader. She developed global improvement strategies aimed at aligning safety, operational excellence, leadership, and metrics. Marin has a bachelor's of science degree in biosystems engineering from Michigan State University, East Lansing, Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Marin Weimer. And now we will turn it over to you, Marin. Thank you so much. Can you guys see my screen? Can I just get one confirmation? Yep. Yes, Perfect. yes. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's my absolute pleasure to speak on what we're doing in uh, not only Ohio, but specifically at the Ohio State University to support the smart mobility initiatives in smart cities. Um, and so I just want to start to talk about a little bit about what smart mobility means to us and how we define what it is. If we really look at it, it's the movement of people and goods from place to place, job to job, on one social level or another, 
um, to actually improve people's lives. So it's not just technology for the sake of technology or the act of just deploying technology, but it's actually to make a difference and affect people that help them from their day-to-day -day lives. So again, it's the movement of people of goods with what we call the triple zero um, here at Ohio State. So zero accidents and fatalities, zero carbon footprint, and zero stress. So if you look at mobility, and mobility for us has always been the automobile, as I work at the Center for Automo Automotive Research, but it's really gone beyond the automobile and it's more on all of mobility. And so how do you use smart mobility and technology to save lives, whether it's through drones or faster response rate, through improving the lives of older adults and people with disabilities. So for those of us that have no problem getting in our car and driving every day, uh, smart mobility may not seem as important as someone who has lost their ability to drive, whether it's through a disability or through age. And in this era of urbanization that we live in, uh, more and more people are moving into cities. Our cities become very congested. So how do we handle the congestion of getting uh, goods and people and freight in and out of our cities? Um, and also always keeping in mind environmental sustainability and economic sustainability. So what we've done in Central Ohio, which has been very unique, is we've set more of an, a Central Ohio smart mobility vision that says we in Ohio will lead the nation in the development of smart mobility and smart city technology and will have a major impact on transportation that will drive growth within our state and city. And we'll do that through a couple of different areas. Um, we have a very unique proposition of a test bed. The Transportation Research Center is one of the largest independent proving grounds in the country. Um, it's located about 35 miles west of Columbus. And then we have Ohio State University, which is the largest university in the country. It has about 100,000 people in and out of it on a daily basis. Um, and so we call that a contained test bed because it's essentially a city within a city. And we're also working with the state to, we have a grant that has approved a public road that connects these two cities. We'll talk a little bit more about what we've done to be able to improve our smart mobility capabilities. So I want to talk a little bit about the Transportation Research Center and how that really gives Ohio and specifically Central Ohio um, kind of that leg up and that, that advancement with smart mobility. So for those that are unfamiliar, it's in East Liberty, which is a small city um, outside of uh, Marysville. And it's a very large independent trust tech, like I said, for those in the mobility space. Um, you can see this picture kind of gives you a, an airplane view of what a proving ground looks like. And what they've done is they've invested a tremendous amount of money on this. You see out in the north end of the track to really create a smart mobility center. And this center will connect Ohio State Smart Columbus and TRC to be this overall smart mobility corridor. And the Smart Mobility Center will give a, a very unique experience for those that want to test, whether it's OEMs or Tier 1, they want to be able to test this autonomous vehicle space in the largest test area that will be um, in the country. And so it will offer a lot of different things that are not available now, such as flexible platforms, um, a 6 by 6 mega intersection, urban networks and a lot of control centers so that you can test autonomous and connected vehicle capabilities in a proven ground setting. So just a few fun facts about what they're doing there at the research center. So it will be the only smart center contained within an independent proving ground. Uh, it will contain the longest um, high-speed intersection. Um, like I mentioned, the 6x6. Six six. It'll have the largest high-speed intersection in the world. It'll be the longest dynamic platform and the most flexible as well. So a lot of opportunity. There are some smaller scale smart testing beds right now, but this will be the, the world's largest. And I talked a little bit about the 33 corridor. So what this is, is 33 is a stretch of highway that connects the Transportation Research Center to Columbus. Um, and right now we're in the process of the first phase of this is to actually put high-speed data and fiber optic cables that will connect these two uh, research center and Columbus together. So the fiber line will have two routes about 35 miles long and this will allow us to monitor traffic. It will serve as enhanced connection between autonomous and connected vehicles and really give us that test route on a state highway to be able to test those vehicles.
Along with that test bed, um, we're developing some apps that allow travelers to book a trip, um, help decrease congestion, so allowing employees to use ride sharing um, and just giving that really real-time data as well as um, alerting data to warnings that are coming up, whether it is through uh, accidents or congested traffic that will slow traffic down. All of these things are being developed in this app that help really communicate to the driver or the autonomous vehicle as they're connected and tested so that they have the ability to warn motorists of impending dangers and bottlenecks up in the road ahead. Another initiative that we're working here at Ohio State is the Smart Belt Coalition. So the Smart Belt Coalition is a tri-state collaboration that was co-founded at Ohio State. It's a multi-state collaboration that um, works on connecting Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, so all of the different stakeholders within that, including Carnegie Mellon University, University of Michigan, the different Department of Transportation within those states. Um, and really working on the transportation of freight and goods with a goal to eventually expand from New York City to Chicago, so having that main route of goods from the seaboard um, and working on different connected smart roads between those different states. So I mentioned all of the folks that are involved there, again, most of the government, a lot of the priority corridors that connect those three states together, as well as the higher level learning institutions within those different states. So, so far they've kicked off several meetings. Um, they're starting to work on the governance documents right now. So they just recently had a press release and they're in the process of building their strategic plan that will really align where they're going and what they'll focus on. But most of the priority applications will be um, traffic management warning systems, working on freight and truck parking. So right now a lot of trucks park at, whether it's rest stops or along the side of highways, so not safe conditions, not ideal conditions. So how do we optimize truck parking? Um, work lanes, so lots of construction is always taking place. So having lane reservation systems, understanding where work zones will be. As well as safe and efficient response time. So as we work on truck platooning, last mile shuttling in different work zones, having that connected communication between the vehicles uh, and between the infrastructure as well. And so then as I look at what we're doing specifically at Ohio State um, and here at the Center of Automotive Research and how that also plays into the smart mobility. So we've been doing smart mobility here um, since the 70s, but really working on smart, sustainable and being part of that smart city. Um, a big struggle we have here, specifically in the Midwest, is that first mile, last mile solution. So I can get people relatively close to their destination, but how do we get people actually to the destination and from the destination so that we can have, that's the weakest point right now that we'll focus on. From the automobile itself, we also work very heavily on what do we do to optimize the internal combustion engine. So as we work on electrifying a lot of vehicles and making them uh, greener and more sustainable, the internal combustion engine will still be there for, uh, for many, many, many years. So what do we do to optimize the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity or the vehicle-to-infrastructure connectivity through the powertrain so that we can optimize how the vehicle, whether it's adaptive cruise control um, or whatever the vehicle may be able to do and leverage those opportunities to develop new tools so that we can optimize our powertrain systems in our vehicles now. So this is some of the work we're doing within Ohio State to be able to improve fuel economy, be more sustainable, be more connected, um, utilizing some of the powertrain systems we have today. Um, we also have at Ohio State the OSU Campus Transit Lab. So we have our civil environmental engineering group here works with our CABS group, which is our campus bus system here. So there's a lot of routes, there's a lot of community, a lot of passengers, and it really serves as a research lab to do a lot of proof of concept development and testing within the university. So some of the unique characteristics of having this living lab on campus is the physical proximity. So we have uh, lots of data and lots of infrastructure within the campus to be able to utilize. We have students that utilize the, the work a lot and help us observe and research and educate so that we can understand what it means to have this living lab. Um, and because of the size of our campus, it's a huge campus with a lot of diverse campus activities, we have a lot of complex examples that we can use. 
So data is um, data, data, data. We have lots of data. It's continually collected and downloaded and stored in our automatic vehicle location. So every bus has this high temporal frequency that we can grab all this information. And then what are we going to do with this information? So then we use this information to help detect congestion patterns, um, do analysis on the vehicle itself, scheduling service and reliability, so really understanding kind of how to better paint a picture of the vehicle itself and how it interacts with its surrounding to optimize that. Some of the specific applications that we've used is using some of the LIDAR or the sensors within the vehicle to help detect traffic flows um, and develop traffic speed profiles within those as well as using video imagery from the bus itself to be able to understand traffic speed patterns, um, conflict detection among transit and other vehicles, and detect pedestrians and other vehicles on the road. And then it collects all that data and allows us to analyze the data to figure out how do we better paint this picture and then use that to for, as a platform for parking, bike sharing, car sharing, um, other on-demand services which may involve electric and automatic vehicles and areas that we continue to expand this lab to understand how this data um, is useful and what we can do with it to optimize our vehicles on campus. So in all of the, the development of all of these things kind of pulled together and we're really proud here at Ohio State and within the city to be able to pull all these technologies and data. So we have we have a very collaborative workspace here and that's kind of a, a unique sweet spot of Ohio State is to have a large campus and university that can pull together mechanical, computer science, electric, electrical, civil environmental engineers, um, all with the intent to improve people's lives. That is all I have. Randy, it is all you. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, oh, Mary. Yeah. Um, I, next up, we have Randy Bowman. He's the uh, Assistant Public Service Director for the City of Columbus. Um, Randy is presently in a, oh, I'm sorry, he served as Columbus City Engineer for much of the last decade, joining the city to help reorganize the department and guide an extensive multi-year, multi-million dollar program to comply with the consent decree for the construction of wheelchair ramps. As the city's first mobility options administrator, he directed and managed implementation of complete streets, pedestrian accommodation, and a complete modernization of the city's parking meter program. He oversaw the development of the city's first bikeways plan and complete streets policy. Randy led the application writing team for this Columbus Smart City Challenge application, and he's now serving as Deputy Program Manager for Smart Columbus. Uh, please join me in welcoming Randy. Good afternoon. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I just want to confirm you can see my screen okay. Yep, we can. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to talk about the Smart Columbus uh, program, and uh, Marin gave a great presentation. I'm just uh, constantly reminded uh, of, of the great collaboration and uh, complementing uh, efforts that we have uh, between what the city is doing with the Smart Columbus program and what Ohio State is, is engaged in. Um, so I want to talk about uh, overall what is our program. It's, it's outcome-based, and it, it connects to uh, the, the outcomes that USDOT uh, is seeking through the Smart City uh, Challenge, and those include safety, mobility, uh, uh, increasing ladders of opportunity for all members of our community, and uh, also uh, dealing with climate change. It starts with a vision, and our vision of, of uh, a Smart City as it relates to uh, this grant program uh, is up at the top, and it, it relates to improving access to jobs uh, uh, deploying and demonstrating smart logistics, uh, uh, better connecting our residents to goods and services uh, in the transportation uh, realm, uh, and also connecting our visitors uh, to a downtown as well as to other parts of the city, and we want a transportation system that is certainly sustainable. Um, we're going to do this uh, through uh, the deployment of several enabling technologies, everything from uh, a connected uh, traffic signal system that will be the backbone uh, for several of our projects, uh, traffic signals that are connected via a fiber optic cable uh, to the city's uh, brand new state-of-the-art trans uh, transportation uh, uh, management center, uh, to uh, an integrated data exchange that will 
be a lake of, of, of data streaming from all sorts of, of sources uh, in our projects through the program that will be uh, publicly available in a secure and uh, privatized anonymized fashion as, as needed. Um, to enhance human services, which is a fancy term for applications uh, that we will be launching to uh, connect our users, our transportation users, to several of the projects that we'll be deploying. And then, of course, electric vehicle infrastructure, which is a, uh, a, a major focus of the Bolton grant that we won, uh, a $10 million grant in addition to the $40 million uh, from USDOT. And we're going to deploy uh, uh, projects in four geographic regions of the city. Uh, we believe that uh, just about every city has uh, uh, four basic archetypes of, of neighborhoods or districts. Everything from a residential neighborhood to a commercial district. Uh, every city has a downtown and, and pretty much every city has a, has a logistics area or district uh, in, as part of the community. So uh, the location of the four districts uh, archetypes that we uh, selected in our grant application uh, uh, are displayed on the screen. Uh, the residential district that we've chosen is the Linden neighborhood. Downtown, of course, is the center of the city. Our commercial district is a town center uh, uh, that's a commercial, uh, a residential, um, entertainment, shopping, and employment center on the northeast side of town called Easton. Uh, and then lo the logistics district uh, is centered around uh, the Rickenbacker Intermodal Hub, one of the largest in the, in the country, and it's uh, pretty much a cargo-only airport. So talking about uh, the residential district, the Linden neighborhood, uh, it's an underserved neighborhood situated northeast of the downtown uh, district. Uh, underserved communities throughout the United States, unfortunately, share many of the same challenges that Linden is experiencing, everything from uh, uh, food deserts to uh, infant mortality. Uh, by deploying smart technology solutions in Linden, uh, Smart Columbus uh, program is going to demonstrate how this, these next generation transportation technologies uh, can impact neighborhoods uh, like this in, in a positive way. And the, the projects that we've selected for the Linden neighborhood include a common payment system, um, if you think about it, many transportation providers uh, like car sharing or bike sharing or personal transit operator services require a credit card or debit based card account. Uh, our integrated common payment system will allow travelers to use one card and one app uh, for all of their transportation options. And this system is, is meant to also uh, give opportunity for the unbanked and in the London neighborhood and other neighborhoods around the city to uh, have access to these other mobility options. Uh, the city is uh, working with the Central Ohio uh, Transit Authority, or CODA, uh, on uh, our regional banks and also will be working with a payment processing company to implement this common payment system. Um, next is the multimodal trip planning uh, app. Uh, and this app is going to be providing travelers uh, with transit vehicle schedule information, allowing travelers to request and view multiple trips. Uh, the users uh, will be able to compare travel options across modes and plan their travel based on current traffic conditions and availability of services. Uh, if the intent to include information on parking availability, ride sharing options, and car or bicycle sharing options uh, that are customizable to user preferences. An example I use is if I have a Fitbit and I want to get in so many steps per day, uh, I, uh, our, our app uh, is expected to provide options that allow you to be dropped off from a code of bus uh, a block or two from uh, your destination to get, help you get those steps in. Uh, third up is uh, our smart mobility hubs. Uh, we will use these hubs along the Cleveland Avenue corridor, uh, our smart mobility corridor that will be deploying to our project. Um, in order to facilitate access to a bus rapid transit project that CODA is launching uh, early next year, as well as uh, transitioning to other modes of, of travel once, once you leave the bus. Uh, as part of the, the bus rapid transit project, uh, transit stops uh, throughout the smart corridor on Cleveland Avenue uh, may also be equipped with additional technologies 
uh, uh, such as uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, info kiosks, uh, perhaps uh, parking for electric vehicles to charge uh, at a right, uh, a park and ride, uh, etc. Uh, additionally, uh, we uh, expect the neighborhood hubs to be used to, to help facilitate first and last mile travel by supporting a range of modal options, such as expanding the city's bike share service into the London neighborhood. Uh, next up is uh, an app uh, uh, to provide assistance, mobility assistance for uh, residents with cognitive disabilities. Uh, during the writing of our grant application, uh, we learned of uh, an app uh, uh, that provides assistance to folks that have uh, um, short-term memory problems or memory issues in remembering their trips. So the app uh, uh, is expected to provide uh, behind-the-scenes support to to the app user to get from point A to point B. Um, these projects uh, are, are in development. I'll actually talk about where we are with, with uh, uh, the program as a whole. And as we get into the, further into the planning process, we'll work through the details with our many partners, including, of course, uh, members of our community. So uh, the commercial district is about one, one project particularly, and it's connected electric uh, automated vehicles. Um, there are a total of three routes that we're looking at, uh, everything uh, uh, in and around the eastern uh, um, commercial district, which includes a transit center from, uh, from CODA uh, to a warehouse area, uh, as well as uh, to corporate campuses that are in the eastern area, uh, and the retail and shopping that's, uh, that's all throughout eastern. Um, the idea is that the electric automated vehicles uh, will pro help provide that first mile, last mile solution once you get off of, of a Coda bus and get to your ultimate destination. Uh, the city is proposing six uh, uh, vehicles that will be deployed in a live environment. They'll be interacting with other vehicles, uh, pedestrians, cyclists, uh, and other users of, of the, the, the roadway, navigating through both signalized and, and non-signalized intersections. Um, these uh, uh, intersections with uh, high pedestrian volumes uh, we'll equip those with pedestrian detection equipment to further aid uh, the safety and, and operations of, uh, of the uh, electric automated uh, vehicle. Uh, the downtown district, uh, uh, we have three projects that we are uh, expecting to deploy applying to downtown. Uh, first is the delivery zone. So we have bread trucks that are delivering bread to restaurants in busy areas, and if uh, they come up to a public loading zone on the street and it's full, uh, they either circle the block until they find an empty space or they double park. Uh, and we would like to have smart delivery zones that uh, will stream um, up to the second uh, occupancy information. That will be streamed out through our integrated data exchange and made available uh, through an app uh, to delivery truck users so they'll, they'll better plan their, their trip. Uh, enhanced permit parking, we have an offer from one of our partners to use uh, uh, RFID tags uh, to uh, help us uh, explore their use uh, in um, uh, making uh, parking more efficient in permit parking areas uh, in and around the, the, the downtown as well as enforcement activities. And then lastly, uh, we'll be uh, working with our con visitor and convention bureau uh, to develop a real-time parking application and event parking management uh, uh, app for uh, visitors to uh, uh, Central Ohio uh, with the idea of providing direct routing for those travelers uh, to uh, their parking destination to help uh, reduce the overall congestion and enhance their experience as they visit Columbus. Um, the logistics district is about uh, a truck platooning demonstration where truck number two follows truck number one and wirelessly uh, uh, the uh, uh, throttle and uh, braking of the second truck uh, can be linked to the, the, the braking and throttle activities of the first truck. The idea uh, will be to help mitigate the uh, congestion on our roadways and, and enhance uh, fuel efficiency. Uh, oversized vehicle routing, uh, the bridge in the photo, we call it the can opener. Uh, and sadly, uh, every so often, uh, tractor trailers hit that bridge. If we provide, which we will, information on low overhead obstructions or width or, or bridge weight restrictions through our integrated data exchange, we hope that that will help uh, the uh, safety and operations of our logistics uh, business uh, community. And then lastly, we're working with Ohio Department of Transportation 
uh, to make available their project, their information on an interstate truck parking uh, uh, through our integrated data exchange. Uh, we uh, are governed uh, by um, an executive committee uh, that is advising us on uh, all matters related to our program from a high level. And we also have assembled working groups uh, that are advising us on our various projects. On the left-hand side, you'll see 11 working groups that we've assembled. On the right-hand side, uh, they're advising us on the 15 projects uh, that we are uh, uh, pursuing through the U.S. DOT grant. Uh, the groups uh, range in size from less than a dozen uh, local or regional experts up to upwards of, of 30 members. Um, and since December, we've held uh, at, at least 20 meetings with these groups with uh, frequently uh, meetings with uh, the chairs and co-chairs of the, of, the, of the group. So we're getting a lot of good advice. Uh, in addition to these more technical-minded working groups, we also have uh, overarching working groups that we've assembled to advise us on policy, um, communications, uh, data and analytics, diversity and inclusion, and uh, uh, a new one uh, uh, on culture and creativity because uh, with our diverse population, uh, if we want to succeed as a smart city, we've got to be able to communicate to all members of our community. So as promised, uh, here is where we are with our program. Uh, if you uh, point your finger at, at the second A in data collection at the bottom of the chart, that's about where we are on the timeline. Uh, at a high level, uh, we'll have ongoing program management and outreach and communication activities over the course of our four-year grant with USDOT. Uh, but it all started uh, at the end of August of 2016 uh, when we executed our agreement with, with the federal government. Um, the first year, as you can see, of our program is focused on detailed planning and preliminary design activities that we need to do to determine in greater detail what projects we will deploy and how we'll deploy them. Uh, the second and third year of the, of the program will involve developing and designing the various projects, procuring components, testing them, and then deploying them uh, in, our, in our various districts, uh, and also uh, uh, lighting up uh, the cloud uh, with our integrated data exchange. Uh, all projects uh, are expected to be in full swing uh, in, in the operations and maintenance phase by the beginning of our fourth year of the program. Uh, by then, we will be collecting and analyzing many, many data streams. I think Marin said data, data, data. She's exactly right. There's probably a fourth data in there, too. Uh, and we'll be collecting that through the integrated data exchange and making the data available to others, uh, uh, partners, the public, and particularly our, our research community. Uh, to date, we've delivered um, uh, three uh, important documents uh, to, to the USDOT that detail our approach to managing the, the project, our systems engineering approach, and our overall communications and outreach plan. Uh, for the remainder of 2017, uh, we're going to be focused on developing and delivering uh, concept of operations for all of our projects, uh, system architecture and standards plans, uh, system requirements, and uh, various other, other um, upfront planning level documents that help ensure that we are uh, proceeding in an orderly and well, well thought out uh, fashion on these projects. So we anticipate procurements uh, to start as early as the first quarter of 2018 and they'll progress throughout the, the rest of 2018. Um, some projects uh, will be easy to procure, others will, will take more time. Uh, but again, all projects will be fully deployed uh, by August of 2019 uh, so we'll have at least 12 months of data gathering uh, performance measuring and reporting at the end of our four-year grant. Um, one of our requirements from, from the USDOT is that uh, we uh, uh, provide uh, large volumes of information and data about our performance so that they can learn as well as uh, the other 77 cities and more uh, across the country uh, that uh, uh, were interested in, in the Smart City Challenge. So uh, the other grant that, that we uh, have uh, is the uh, grant from Vulcan, and it's uh, on electrifying our fleets and decarbonizing uh, our uh, energy supply. Um, there are five initiatives uh, that we're pursuing. So 
decarbonizing electric uh, supply. Uh, the city is a division of power, um, produces some electricity, but the majority of electricity is produced by uh, the regional uh, producer, AEP Ohio, who is a substantial partner to our effort. Uh, fleet electrification for both public and private fleets. Uh, and uh, there is an overlap of uh, projects and, 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 and the initiative with Vulcan, and that's on the autonomous uh, vehicle that we'll be testing at Ethan. And also, uh, we have a, a very uh, audacious goal uh, for consumer adoption that I'll talk about. And then, of course, to support more electric vehicles in Central Ohio, we need to expand our infrastructure for charging them. So, as I said, AEP Ohio is uh, a substantial partner to our efforts. And one example of their partnership, they've, they've committed to uh, installing nearly one gigawatt of solar and wind uh, uh, statewide that will also uh, help serve Central Ohio. Uh, on the fleet electrification, um, the City of Columbus and many other uh, public fleets uh, are, are, are committing to install, uh, I'm sorry, purchase uh, approximately 300 uh, electric vehicles over the next three years. Uh, we're also working with uh, car share, ride share operators uh, to uh, encourage them to uh, adopt electric vehicles. And also fly private fleet operators from many of the businesses uh, in Central Ohio, we're uh, working with them to encourage their adoption. Um, the uh, Columbus Partnership is an organization of uh, uh, 50 plus top CEOs, top employers uh, in the Central Ohio region uh, who are uh, right along with us uh, helping to ensure that the private sector is, is on board and actually uh, we hope exceeding uh, the goals that we have set. Um, this is the overlap project uh, between the Vulcan grant and USDOT grant, uh, the six electric autonomous vehicles that we'll be purchasing along with uh, some uh, EV pedal assist bicycles that we'll be deploying in the London neighborhood to expand the city's COGO um, bike share program. And our audacious goal for consumer adoption, uh, we're looking to uh, quadruple uh, the number of new car registrations by 2018. Columbus in Ohio is not a Zev state, uh, uh, but we have set uh, lofty expectations for uh, 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 encouraging and uh, the adoption and purchase of new uh, electric vehicles uh, in the Central Ohio region. Uh, we are uh, working with uh, automakers uh, as well as uh, the organization, the Columbus Partnership I mentioned, uh, to help move the, the needle on um, electric vehicle adoption by consumers. And then we're, we're projecting at least, uh, at least 1,700 new charging stations to be installed for public charging, fleet charging, uh, residential and multi-unit uh, developments, as well as uh, workplace charging uh, throughout Central Ohio. Uh, in as much as working groups are advising uh, the 15 U.S. DOT funded projects, we have set up four working groups of uh, local, regional, national experts to advise us on the 14 uh, different electrification uh, initiatives uh, uh, that you'll see on screen. And lastly, I want to talk about partnerships. Um, we have uh, uh, amassed a total of 20 partners thus far uh, to assist us uh, on our, our various projects and initiatives. Um, USDOT brought to the table uh, 10 partners. Uh, their value of their partnership is just under $20 million. You see the partners that are included. Vulcan is one of them uh, and many other uh, uh, private ent entities as well as U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, we're negotiating uh, many of these uh, partnerships uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the partners know exactly what their role is and, and we know how they'll help us move, uh, move forward on, on our projects. Uh, we have 18 partners uh, that we brought to the table. Uh, the value of those partnerships right now is just shy of 300 million and it continues to grow. I want to thank you all very much uh, for your time today. And, and as I close, I'd like to leave you with uh, our email address, which is smartcolumbus at columbus.gov. Uh, uh, you can uh, get in touch with us, ask any question you wish after, after today, uh, and uh, we'll get information back to you. We're excited about the program. Uh, we set up a, a website, and uh, the, the address is on the screen. Uh, stay in touch with that, with, uh, that website. And, 
stay in touch with us as we learn and as we grow. Um, I can tell you that as we approach our one-year anniversary in, of the announcement of us winning the grant in June, uh, uh, we will be rebranding uh, our program and, and uh, uh, coming out with a, a much more advanced uh, website uh, just in, in a couple of months' time. So thank you very much for your time today. I'm happy to answer uh, your questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Randy, and thank you again, Marin. Uh, we've got a few questions that have been entered into the question box. If um, individuals are listening, you can um, uh, type in your questions, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, the first one we have is, uh, with your first year now uh, you know, well underway, what are the key challenges that Columbus has encountered in becoming smart, and how are they addressing those challenges? I think I think part of uh, uh, one, one of our greatest challenges in this first year is there is so much interest in uh, assisting in the program and uh, providing support uh, or opportunities. Uh, it's been uh, I tell people it's like drinking from a 24-inch water main. Uh, so what we do is we, along with Ohio State University and the Columbus Partnership and other partners. We are uh, organizing and, and better organized now uh, to respond to the interest from uh, the private sector, other municipalities, other government entities to provide information or to explore partnerships. Um, uh, we, we amassed initially about 250 companies uh, that wanted to, to work with us and uh, we uh, have been peeling away at that list and meanwhile uh, new prospective partners uh, come to the table and it takes time to uh, understand uh, who they are, what they bring to the table, and see how they fit into our program, either during the grant phase or, or more particularly uh, uh, after the grant phase so we can sustain our program and our projects and grow them uh, beyond, beyond just uh, uh, the projects we're doing over the next four years. Marin, did you have... Um, no, building on the, I don't oh, think sorry, I have anything to add on to that. No, I, think, okay. I, I, don't, I don't actually think I, I think Randy answered that beautifully. Excellent. Uh, building on that, I'm just curious, are there lessons learned in that first year uh, that other cities should be aware of to make it easier for them as they move forward with implementation of their own programs, uh, you know, to of their own smart cities programs? Well, I think I think just dovetailing on that uh, uh, in in my experience, but my the major responsibility of my work right now is is about developing partnerships and communicating with companies. I think don't discount the time needed to to talk with prospective partners uh, about their interests in the smart city space uh, and how we want to make this a living laboratory of demonstration deployments over the next four years. But how do we uh, grow those partnerships, leverage them uh, so that we, we grow opportunity uh, and improve transportation mobility choices uh, in Central Ohio region uh, over the next uh, many, many years. Excellent. Um, looking at the outcome side, another question that we received, what do you anticipate or expect uh, for the impacts on single occupancy vehicles through this program? I think that's, that's yet to be learned. Um, we uh, uh, want uh, more, uh, uh, we want fewer uh, um, single occupancy vehicles, certainly, and we believe that uh, uh, coupling uh, the electric autonomous vehicle deployment as a first mile, last mile solution to using more traditional mass transit, we, we are, are hopeful uh, that we're going to see a rise in, in the use of mass transit if a rider knows that if they've got uh, upwards of five or six or, or more blocks to walk after they get off of a bus, that they have an opportunity to hop on uh, a shuttle that can take them to that destination or much closer to that destination uh, uh, in inclement weather or if they're uh, they have bags or, or a stroller or, or um, if, um, if, if they're a disabled uh, a customer. So we're hoping we're going to see uh, a rise in, in the usage of, of uh, the, the bus routes that will be 
uh, served by uh, the electric autonomous vehicle. And then, of course, by providing apps um, that uh, show options for a user uh, that could include uh, driving a car, but also uh, uh, provide op options to connect to car sharing or the mass transit options or, or bike share or, or <laughs> simple walking. Uh, we're hoping that, that uh, by analyzing uh, the performance data uh, from these apps that we'll, we'll see a, an uptick in, in the usage of uh, alternate modes other than a single occupancy vehicle. Excellent. Yep. In this, uh, the next question, uh, and it might be more for Marin, uh, in the transit pedestrian safety area, is this where bicycle crash issues would, are being handled? And how are autonomous vehicles being programmed to avoid collisions with bicyclists? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have an entire team that focuses on not only the build of autonomous vehicles, but more importantly is the, the we call the moral algorithms that go into the, the software of the, uh, the car itself. So how does it detect crash? How does the car make decisions? Um, that we as humans are perfectly acceptable that you had to make a decision and not hit the student, but if a car has to make a decision, we're, we're suddenly uneasy with that. Um, and utilizing whether it's AI technology as the car learns. Um, and then I, I mentioned TRC before, but having those different testing capabilities allows us to fully vet and test vehicles before they have to encounter a, a child or a person on a bicycle on a road. So lots of work is being put into that right now. I would say it's a good portion of our research. Almost 40% of our research right now is around autonomous and connected vehicle um, and how they interact with not only people, but the surroundings, the road, the infrastructure, um, and how we how we account for situations that you can't predict. Yep. yep. Excellent. Um, another question. Uh, you we saw the list, and, and this goes back to Randy of committees. Uh, the the number of committees that you were forming, and I'm curious a little more um, specifically in regards to the business community and how. Uh, the city is engaging the business community to address issues uh, specific to uh, the commute and uh, um, uh, the commute to work? A uh, very good question. You know, I mentioned uh, the Columbus Partnership. I, I don't think uh, I, I can mention enough the importance of uh, the relationship that uh, we have with the business community in Central Ohio, the leadership of uh, Many of the, the private sector uh, employers uh, are, are helping us uh, um, connect uh, users, uh, employees um, to our various projects um, through either uh, communicating um, to their employees or helping uh, set up programs. Um, uh, one thing I, I would like to highlight is uh, uh, the, the partnership will be helping us significantly on workplace uh, uh, charging and workplace adoption uh, by uh, helping to um, uh, create, say, uh, uh, a group purchasing plans for electric vehicles uh, um, uh, at, at, through, through, the, through the employer. Um, another uh, effort that the partnership has been uh, um, at the forefront of is uh, rolling out um, in parallel to our USDOT projects uh, a, uh, an employer uh, subsidized uh, transit pass program uh, for many of the downtown employees where an employer uh, can join in on the program and provide a, say, a transit benefit to uh, their employees in, in, instead of providing another uh, very expensive parking space, uh, encourage uh, uh, the employer through, or the employee through uh, 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 this transit pass program to, uh, to take the, the code instead. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I think I have another one here for Marin. How are you planning to address mobility assistance uh, for people with cognitive disabilities? Uh, I think that's a great question. And oh. so, as you look at, oops, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. So, as you look at the future of autonomous vehicles, which are projected to be on the road and potentially the next five years, and, and heavily on the road by 2020. 
is um, that when you get to a level five or a full autonomous vehicle, you'd be able to accommodate people with those cognitive disabilities. So we, we obviously have a long ways to go, and there's a lot of research to be done and a lot of work to be done putting into those. A lot of policy and legislation needs to be put into place. But, but I think that's where, as you look at people with those types of disabilities, this is where autonomous vehicles become a wonderful solution to them um, to be able to be mobile still and not lose their ability and capability to drive. I, I could I could just add to that too the the very specific project that I mentioned as part of our program uh, we're looking for uh, uh, an app to to demonstrate the ability to provide turn-by-turn uh, -turn assistance to uh, a user with a cognitive disability uh, with the idea that uh, a caregiver uh, behind the scenes uh, has the ability to provide uh, assistance to to the user of the app and the app uh, would provide not only turn by turn, but also uh, we would hope uh, provide some visual cues uh, to provide assistance to to that user to get to the destination. Excellent. Uh, while we're on the on the topic of users, what are you doing to involve the user? Are you carrying out user experience research for autonomous vehicles or multimodal transportation? Yes, yeah, so we incorporate uh, the user as a, a key piece of all of the data applications that we use. And so being able to test the vehicle itself is one, but being able to partner with whether it's SAE or some of the other entities out there that are part of that user group. And I think one of the unique capabilities that Ohio State provides is to really allow us access to a tremendous amount of expertise and capabilities and collaboration across the university. So we're not just focused on engineering and the vehicle itself. We have partners in the cognitive sciences, the behavioral, the medical unit that are all working together to pull all this data and all these different pieces that kind of shape the new space of smart mobility and what that looks like. So, so I would say that's a key part of our research and maybe even majority of the research. It's, it's, you could say the engineering is, is quote unquote easy compared to the human portion of it. <laughs> Another question, how is carpooling and shared mobility in general playing a role in the plan for Columbus as a smart city? Well, uh, it's uh, one of our, currently one of our options in, in, the, in central Ohio, uh, and we want to raise the level of awareness and the opportunity to connect to the existing services as well as any emerging services that uh, we may end up partnering with. Uh, uh, through this, this grant activity, uh, through the use of the, the multimodal uh, trip planning application. All righty, I think we have time for just a, a couple more questions here. And um, another one, using TNCs for first mile, last mile transit makes a lot of sense. However, will you be studying whether new mobility options may or may not Decipher or you know take away ridership from public transportation, and what protections are in place to ensure this doesn't occur? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that's actually very relevant. So we've partnered with a major manufacturer just recently on a on a research project we're doing that actually has um, multi-use freight and human mixed uh, um, transportation. So as you look at some of the city buses where. There's a large portion of them, at least here in Columbus, that may go mostly or partially unused. And so how do you have that multimodal communication pieces? So heavy, heavy focus on that and how do you get goods and services? We've looked at even at the possibility of drones and drone usage and how do you, again, capitalize on uh, vehicles that are already going to be in the city um, and routes that are already taken as well as different mobility solutions. So. So heavy focus on that right now, um, and I think there's going to be some really interesting solutions that come out as we look at transportation as a whole, um, specifically on UPS trucks and FedEx trucks and, and U.S. Postal Service vehicles, and how do you combine that with human vehicles to to be efficient, sustainable, um, and really get that first mile, last mile solution together. Excellent. Excellent. Um, just two more here. In regards to autonomous vehicles and existing infrastructure, how does the Columbus team see the mixed use of roads if and when autonomous vehicles increase along the along with the traditional cars? Looking at safety yeah, and so, yeah. yeah. Um, I think for the I, I've heard some statistics, but in the next 20 years, um, it'll obviously be a majority of 
of, of dumb or non-smart vehicles on the road intermixed with smart vehicles. So a lot of the work we're doing right now is how do you communicate, um, how does the vehicle communicate to non-communicating items, whether it's a, a house, a tree, a car, or another vehicle. Um, so using different technology through sensors, your cell phone, I mean, most people having cell phones on them becomes a huge data um provider as well as putting in some of the infrastructure that the city's doing through stoplights, um, laying fiber optic cables. So it's a, a larger plan and strategy on how do you put these vehicles on the roads when they can't communicate with the majority of other vehicles. And that again, I keep referencing the, the smart center at TRC, but, but the really uniqueness of that corridor and that city is to be able to test all of these different scenarios in a very safe setting that um, allows us to collect the data, analyze the research, um, in an area where you're not just putting it out there on the roads and seeing how it goes. Um, so we've got the capability to interact vehicles with, with smart vehicles, with dumb vehicles, with vehicles that have some form of communication. Um, and how do you leverage those different technologies? So, so I would say I don't have a good answer with what we're doing, um, but it's something that we are focused heavily on. Excellent. And then lastly, uh, it's always the biggest question is, uh, the resource side and uh, a question around, uh, you know, after the grant period ends, will you have the, the resources uh, to continue with uh, the deployment and support of the Smart Cities program? <laughs> uh, that, that is a question. Uh, we do not expect to flip a big light switch to the opposition after the, the grant is over. Uh, we are, uh, as, as much as we're focused on uh, developing the projects, uh, uh, for for their deployment, at the same time, um, uh, leaders uh, in Central Ohio are are focusing on um, what what is the what is the, the sustainability and, and how of, of this effort and how do we grow it uh, beyond uh, the, the 28 projects and initiatives that we that I've talked about today, uh, and that includes you know how does the private sector and government Grow closer together uh, to make these 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 things happen and uh, to achieve those four basic outcomes uh, that USDOT uh, uh, wants us to achieve. So uh, we are uh, uh, we we are looking at that and there is the the commitment by leadership without without their buy-in without their understanding you know the uh, the program uh, uh, will will not succeed in, in the long run but. Thankfully, uh, Central Ohio has uh, a, a tremendous track record of collaboration between academia, uh, private sector, and, and public sector, and non nonprofits working together achieve, to achieve great goals. And uh, uh, this uh, this program and the idea of, of a smart community, as, as Marin talked about, you know, that is uh, exactly uh, what uh, what our, our leadership in Central Ohio is is looking towards. So, with their buy-in. Uh, we'll expect that uh, uh, that the program will not only be sustained but be scaled up and, and replicated and, and grow uh, substantially. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're right up at towards the top of the hour. I want to uh, thank both Randy and Marin for for presenting today. There's been some great information. And I know um, you know there's a, a, a loud, silent applause taking place out there uh, across phone lines around the country. Um, we look forward to, to staying in touch and, and continuing to, to you know, hear about the progress that's being made and, and look forward to you know, maybe having another event a year from now to, to see where things stand. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, please take a moment to fill out the evaluation. Uh, there'll be a follow-up email that goes out as well to remind you. Uh, and uh, stay tuned for uh, our next webinar uh, that will be announced shortly. Thank you.